when there is a heavy downpour of rain, or when we water our plants in the garden, it is the roots that absorb water for the plant. More specifically, the millions of root hairs present on the root tips absorb both water and minerals from the soil. These root hairs not only increase the surface area for absorption, but also assist in water absorption through diffusion. After water is absorbed, it moves deeper into the root layers by one of two pathways, apoplast and symplast. Apoplast is a continuous system of adjacent cell walls in a plant interrupted only by waxy, suburized Casparian strips in the root endodermis. So apoplastic movement of water occurs through intercellular spaces and permeable cell walls. Water movement is through mass flow and is dependent on the gradient. As water evaporates in the intercellular space, it creates tension in the water flowing inside the apoplast. Mass flow is thus propelled by the adhesive and cohesive properties of water. On the other hand, the symplastic pathway is a system of interconnected protoplasms. In symplastic movement, water travels through the cell cytoplasm, while intercellular movement is through the plasma desmata. Water movement takes place down the potential gradient. As water enters the cells through the not so permeable cell membrane in the symplastic pathway, water movement is slower. However, the symplastic pathway is aided by cytoplasmic streaming, that is, the movement of the cytoplasm. Unlike the rest of the root, the inner boundary of the cortex that is, the endodermis, is impervious to water due to the presence of Casparian strips. As water molecules are unable to penetrate this layer, they move to wall regions that are not suburized like Casparian strips. Instead, they move inside the other non-suburized cells through the membrane. This water movement too is through the symplast, allowing water to cross a membrane to reach the xylem cells. Therefore, water movement through root layers is symplastic in the endodermis, and it is the only pathway that allows water and solutes to reach the vascular cylinder. Water moves freely again once it is inside the xylem and enters the xylem vessels and tracheids. These xylem elements are non-living and therefore become a part of the apoplast movement which occurs in the non-living parts of the root. Some plants have additional structures associated with their roots to help in absorption. Mycorrhiza, a symbiotic association between a fungus and a root system is one such example. Fungal hyphae absorb larger volumes of minerals and water from the soil because they have a large surface area. In turn, roots provide sugar and nitrogen containing compounds to mycorrhizae. Some plants like pinus seeds cannot even germinate without mycorrhizae. Hence, they are said to be in obligate association with the mycorrhizae. However, irrespective of how water is absorbed, water moves deeper into the root layers through two pathways, that is, apoplast and symplast. When plant roots absorb water and minerals from the soil, they move it in an upward direction to reach different parts of the plant. 
Have you ever wondered how this upward movement of water and minerals takes place? This is made possible by a combination of root pressure and transpirational pull. Along with the water, various mineral ions from the soil are also pushed into the root vascular tissues by diffusion. As a result, the pressure inside the xylem increases. This positive pressure is known as root pressure. Root pressure can be observed in a plant by a cut stem experiment. In the early morning hours of a humid day, if a soft stem is cut horizontally near its base with a blade, drops of solution ooze from the cut stem. This oozing is caused by positive root pressure. Now try fixing a rubber tube to this cut stem. You will be able to collect and measure the rate of exudation and also determine the composition of exudates. The impact of root pressure is best witnessed during the night and early in the morning when evaporation is slow. At this time, the excess water collects as droplets around the special openings of veins called hydathodes near the tip of grass blades. This water loss in its liquid form is called guttation. However, root pressure itself does not account for the majority of water transport because it can provide only a modest push. Most water movement in tall trees takes place due to transpirational pull. The driving force behind this transpirational pull is transpiration from the leaves. Transpiration is the process of water loss through stomata in the leaves. Unlike guttation, where water is lost in liquid form, water is lost as vapor during transpiration. Transpiration can be witnessed by closing a healthy plant inside a polythene bag. You will notice that droplets of water have formed inside the bag. These water droplets are caused by the loss of water from leaf stomata by transpiration. The water loss due to transpiration pulls the water upwards in a plant stem. Did you know that the transpirational pull generated by this process of transpiration is strong enough to cause water to move upwards even in tall trees by as much as 15 meters per hour? Water transport is also aided by cohesion and surface tension. Cohesion is the mutual attraction between water molecules. And surface tension is the force acting on a water molecule traveling upwards in the xylem. Since cohesion tension helps the transpirational pull, it is also known as the cohesion tension transpirational pull model of water transport. Therefore, we can conclude that together, transpirational pull and root pressure are responsible for the upward movement of water in plants. Did you know that a fully grown tree may lose thousands of liters of water through its leaves on a hot dry day through transpiration? Transpiration is the loss of water due to evaporation that occurs through pores in leaves called stomata. Stomata are not only the site of water loss for transpiration, they also help in the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the leaf. They remain open during the day when transpiration takes place and close at night. Their opening and closing is directly impacted by the turgidity of guard cells present near the stomatal aperture. The inner wall of each guard cell is thick and elastic. When turgidity inside two guard cells increases, 
The outer walls bulge and force the inner walls to take the shape of a crescent. The radial orientation of the cellulose microfibrils in the cell wall of the guard cell helps open the stomata. When guard cells lose terga, they become flaccid, while the elastic inner cell walls regain their original shape, leading to the closure of the stomata. Transpiration is affected by both external factors like temperature, light, humidity, etc., and plant factors like the number and distribution of stomata. Typically, the lower surface of a dorsiventral dicot leaf has a greater number of stomata. On the other hand, a monocot isobilateral leaf has an equal number of stomata on both surfaces. Transpiration from stomata causes a pull that causes the upward ascent of water in xylem cells. This transpiration pull is made possible by three physical properties of water. Cohesion, adhesion, and surface tension. Cohesion is the mutual attraction between water molecules. Adhesion is the property of water to be attracted to polar surfaces like tracheids and vessel elements also known as tracheary elements, in a xylem cell. Finally, surface tension is the property of water molecules to be more attracted to each other in a liquid state than in a gaseous state. Together, the properties of adhesion, cohesion, and surface tension render water with a high tensile strength. This means that water becomes capable of resisting a pulling force. Also, it gains high capillarity. Capillarity is the ability of water to rise in thin tubes, which is helped by the small diameter of the tracheary elements. This water transported by xylem vessels needs to be moved into the parenchyma cells of leaves, where it is needed for photosynthesis. While water evaporates through stomata during transpiration, a thin film of water appears over the cells, which pulls water, molecule by molecule, into the leaf from the xylem. This transport is helped by the water potential gradient. The concentration of water vapor in the atmosphere is lower than that in the substomatal cavity and intercellular spaces. Thus, Water diffuses into the surrounding air, creating a pull. Did you know that this pressure generated by transpiration pull is capable of lifting water over 130 meters high in a xylem vessel? Transpiration not only creates this pull for the absorption and transport of water for photosynthesis, it also transports minerals from the soil to all parts of the plant. In addition, it cools leaf surfaces by evaporative cooling and maintains the shape and structure of plants by keeping cells turgid. Photosynthesizing plants require a lot of water. Since water swiftly depletes due to transpiration, the lack of available water may limit photosynthesis. Rainforests are humid largely because of this vast recycling of water from root to leaf to atmosphere and then back to soil. The plant C4 photosynthetic system solves this by increasing the availability of carbon dioxide and decreasing water loss. This system is more efficient than the C3 system since it not only fixes carbon twice as a C3 system but also loses half the amount of water lost by the C3 system while fixing the same amount of carbon dioxide. Therefore, transpiration plays an important role in both water transport and photosynthesis in plants. Along with water, 
plants absorb essential nutrients and minerals from the soil. These minerals are present in the soil as charged particles called ions. Absorption of minerals by plant roots occurs through both passive and active transport. In passive transport, the ions do not require energy and just pass through the cell membrane by osmosis or diffusion. Mineral ions move into the root by diffusion whenever the mineral concentration is higher outside the root. On the other hand, active transport takes place when there is higher mineral concentration inside the roots than outside. Since the ions now move against the concentration gradient, they require energy to cross the cell membrane. Some ions, such as potassium, pass through the cell membrane directly without any energy consumption via either membrane protein pumps or proton pumps. Active transport begins with positively charged ions such as hydrogen being pumped out of a cell. Due to the displacement of these hydrogen ions, negatively charged ions move inside the cell. They enter the cytoplasm of the epidermal cells of the root using up the ATP molecule for energy. Furthermore, the membranes of root hair cells have some specific proteins such as calcium ATP bases called transport proteins which actively pump ions into the epidermal cells from the soil. The endodermal cells of the root also have many transport proteins embedded in their plasma membrane. These transport proteins serve as control points where they adjust the quantity and selectively allow certain types of solutes to cross the membrane to reach the xylem. Also, due to the presence of the subarin layer of the Casparian strip, the root epidermis can transport ions passively in one direction only. The active uptake of ions causes a water potential gradient in roots which results in the uptake of water by osmosis. After ions reach the xylem either passively or by active absorption, they are transported up the stem to the various sinks inside the plant body by transpirational pull. The sinks inside plants are usually found in its growing regions like apical and lateral meristems, young leaves, developing fruit, flowers and seeds as well as storage organs. These mineral ions are unloaded at the fine vein endings of leaves through diffusion and are taken up by active transport by associated cells such as mesophyll cells. Plants can also remobilize minerals from older dying parts to young developing parts where they are required. For example, Minerals from old dying leaves of deciduous plants are exported to other parts like young leaves before the leaves fall. Phosphorus, sulfur, nitrogen and potassium are readily mobilized as inorganic ions. While some elements such as calcium that are structural components cannot be remobilized. Small amounts of phosphorus and sulfur are also carried as organic compounds. However, most of the nitrogen is carried as organic compounds in the form of amino acids. Moreover, the xylem and phloem exchange small amounts of the materials they carry. 
both xylem and phloem elements are responsible for the transport of minerals in plants. Plant food is primarily sucrose. It is transported by a vascular tissue called phloem from a source to a sink. The transport of sugars inside the plant by phloem is called translocation. The leaf is usually the source since this is where food is synthesized via photosynthesis while a sink is any part of a plant where food is stored or is required. For example, fruits or roots. However, sink and source roles can be reversed depending on the plant's needs. For example, sugar from the roots may need to be mobilized to a flower bud when they need energy for growth. Therefore, food transport by phloem is bidirectional, both upward and downward. The direction is determined by the concentration of sucrose. This is in contrast to water transport in xylem, which is always upward and unidirectional. A simple experiment called girdling can be used to illustrate the role of phloem cells in trees. In this experiment, a ring of tree bark up to the depth of the phloem layer is carefully removed from the trunk. The portion of the bark above the ring on the stem becomes swollen after a few weeks because the downward movement of food doesn't take place any longer as the phloem cells have been cut. Therefore, it can be concluded that transportation of food takes place via phloem cells. Phloem tissue is made up of sieve tube cells, which are long columns with holes in their end walls. These holes are called sieve plates. Cytoplasmic strands pass through these sieve plates to form continuous filaments. However, most of the cellular functions of sieve tube cells inside the phloem are carried out by companion cells. The fluid that passes through these phloem cells is called phloem sap. It is mainly water and sucrose. In addition, they also transport other sugars, hormones and amino acids from time to time. Phloem sap translocation from source to sink takes place by a mechanism called the pressure flow hypothesis. When plant leaves prepare glucose via photosynthesis, the glucose is then converted into sucrose Sucrose then moves into the companion cells after which it is loaded into the sieve tube cells via active transport. This process of loading of sucrose into the phloem causes a hypertonic condition and sets up a water potential gradient. This in turn results in osmosis which causes water to move into the phloem from the adjacent xylem cells. As osmotic pressure increases in the sieve tube, pressure flow begins and the phloem sap moves towards the sink which has low osmotic pressure. This is followed by the sucrose from the phloem sap unloading into the sink cells via active transport. The loss of sucrose produces a high water potential in phloem. This results in decreased osmotic pressure which causes water to move out of the phloem cells and back into the xylem cells. 
the sink cells then utilize the sucrose for metabolism or storage purposes by converting it into energy starch or cellulose in this manner Bloom cells transport food, primarily sucrose, in plants by the pressure flow hypothesis mechanism.